if you add up all of the existing power plants in the state of Florida, coal, nuclear, oil, gas, uh, it's about 50 gigawatts. If you add up all of the solar resources and biomass and biogas and other renewable resources available, uh, you get to a number which is probably close to 200 uh, gigawatts. In other words, we have three to four times the solar, the uh, renewable resources out there that are currently untapped that we could use to apply to meet the energy demands, electricity demands in the state of Florida. So for those who say uh, and try to uh, be skeptical about whether or not uh, renewables can meet the uh, demands of the state, uh, the answer is the proof is there. The studies have been done. It's a question of getting that and getting that into and getting those resources accessed and built. And how do we do that? Well, that's going to require private sector investment. How do you get private sector investment to be made? You've got to create a profit incentive for them. Uh, you've got to create a structure that allows private capital uh, to, to make that investment. And uh, the reality is you have incumbent monopoly uh, structure that exists in Florida. But when it comes to outside new entrants wanting to build renewable projects, they create layers of bureaucracy, layers of permits, layers of issues, and the utilities at the end of the day won't allow uh, most of these new entrants to sell the power to them. So you have nowhere to go. If you want to invest in Florida in renewables today, it is incredibly difficult to either do it at all or do it profitably. What feed and tariff do is they change that. They change the paradigm. They make it absolutely automatic that anyone who wants to build a renewable project can get access to the transmission grid to sell power. At the end of the day, the utilities own the grid, so they have to take that power. So the law under a feed-in tariff or renewable energy dividend requires those utilities to take that power, all of the power that you produce, and pay you a price that allows you to earn your cost of generation plus a reasonable profit. So you've taken this whole paradigm and turned it upside down, and now you have a regulatory construct that allows any private sector investor that wants to build a solar project on their roof to make a reasonable profit. What is that? Maybe 6 to 7% after tax return, which compared to the investments re you return you can make on investing in CDs or municipal bonds is two to three times that amount now, which makes it attractive, which is why if you go around the rest of the world, people are building renewables. And it's not being done by utilities or utilities only. It's being done by churches, schools farmers, uh, private companies, uh, households. You go to Germany, you sit down and, and you actually analyze the uh, six gigawatts of solar that they have installed there. And 80% of that is small systems that it's on rooftops or um, on small commercial um, uh, land projects, usually under 50 ki uh, uh, kilowatts. That's basically the size of a, a small a uh, gas station or the rooftop for a, a couple of shops. Why have you got a system over there that encourages private sector initiative to basically fund all of those projects? Whereas you come to Florida and the only solar projects we have really being done are, are being done by the utilities. And the answer comes back to an uneven playing field. The utilities are allowed to build these things and we as private citizens uh, have huge regulatory obstacles that prevent us from doing it. And that's what a feed-in tariff really attacks. It, 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 it uh, creates a much more even regulatory playing field that allows everyone to participate. The goal is not to be uh, providing incentives of subsidies in perpetuity. The goal is to um, encourage early adopters to jump in and make their own investments in this. And over time, um, ensure that we can drive down the cost of renewables to a point that it no longer needs any incentive or subsidy structure. As mass adoption of, of these renewable technologies is taking place, and particularly in uh, Europe and other parts of the world, economies of scale are kicking in. And the price uh, or the cost to produce these renewables is falling. And if you take solar, historically over the last sort of 20 years, it's fallen probably at about 6 to 7% per year. That's the cost of production. Uh, now, in the last two to three years, be, there's been a massive amount of investment by manufacturing companies around the world, and that, that new supply is hitting the market right now. And in 2009, the cost 
of solar production is falling uh, probably uh, by 25 to 30 percent. So what does that mean for um, investors in solar? It means that um, over a period of a few years, you're going to see costs come down to a point where it's probably comparable to grid parity. In other words, you're in the state of Florida, we're currently paying, you know, all in around 13 cents uh, for the power that you produce on a retail level. Um, if you can get solar uh, fully installed down to that kind of level, um, we, no lo we no longer need the financial subsidies and incentives um, to encourage investment in renewables. You will still need uh, the regulatory construct that allows you to sell your power to the utility. You will still need access to the transmission grid. Uh, but in a few years' time, it's easy to predict that we'll, we'll probably be at a point where uh, it doesn't make much sense to be building expensive fossil base load power generation uh, because you can get uh, distributed generation, uh, particularly solar and others, at, at cheaper price points than uh, uh, than, than the fossil fuel.